Okay, so I don't know who will ever listen to this, but you know, we have it recorded. So thanks for coming again. Welcome back. We're really excited to be able to chat with you more about all these things in critical digital open pedagogies and STEM. So um, yeah, Brian, did you have any opening words or things you wanted to start with or questions? Well <laughs> I, I know we're going to get to um, some of the questions that came up from, from our, our last meeting, but I guess I just want to open in a, in, a, in a space of honesty with you. You know, um, I'm about to do this with you, with Karen, over the next hour and 15 minutes. And because of this, you know, I couldn't attend another meeting, um, but my wife is gracious enough. She'll attend it on my behalf. And it's a, it's a union meeting. Um, United Faculty of Florida with ACLU and some other people will be attending. And for those of, those of you who don't know my context, I do teach in Florida. Um, and there has been a few bills that have been passed at the state level that have been written in a way that it, it can be interpreted to restrict the degree to which we get to talk about things like equity and inclusion um, on our campuses and in our classrooms. And um, of course, those who wrote it wouldn't say that, but, but you know, you, you have to kind of read between the lines on some of these things, right? And so this isn't, the things we are talking about are not, this, this, not a exercise anymore. this is not a hypothetical, this is not a, you know, maybe people might believe a particular thing, like actively we are in a state where um, we have to have an argument <laughs> for why you need to keep this conversation up. So I think I want, I just want to start with that just to say to you that while I really value spaces like this where people like yourself who believe in the importance of this come and they hear us articulate our message and give us encouragement, I know Karen and I really from the bottom of our hearts appreciate that. We also have to be mindful of how we articulate this to people who perhaps haven't drunk the Kool-Aid yet or who haven't understood it yet and who don't speak in terms like identity contingencies and, and social belonging and all these fancy academic things. Um, that has to be a part of what we do. That has to be part of our calling. And I'll touch on that a little bit uh, in the first couple of slides, but, but the, the, the situation is real, right? And I, I feel like I have to say it because I'm looking around me and I'm not sure if my other academics are really getting the message, right? There's still a little bit of a we were bred to talk about this stuff we, are, we know, right? Which is electrons and molecules and cows and sheep and suns, you know? And, and when I and others say we teach humans, we teach students, not subjects, this is actually partly what we mean, <laughs> right? So their lived realities is also something we have to teach to, which means we have to be forced to articulate things, not always in the way textbooks, I know they need to be abolished, Karen, but not all the ways they articulated. So, Sorry to start on that note, but <laughs> since the other meeting just started, it kind of made me think of it. Welcome, pleasant good afternoon to you. It's hot and sunny here in Miami, Florida, Karen. No, thank you, Brian. I mean, I think that's such an important reminder. Like we're actually sitting in a really privileged space right here mm -hmm. just to be able to have this conversation and it gets wackier every day. Uh, up until recently, I lived in New Hampshire, where they made talking about critical race theory illegal and are uh, making teachers actually sign an oath to say that you're not going to talk about critical race theory, however they're defining that in your class. So this is a reality that we're up against. And, you know, part of this work that we're talking about with bringing an understanding this, of this to your STEM students isn't, isn't just like, oh, isn't that nice? And mm -hmm. isn't it that I'm just being really cool in PC and I'm such a woke mm -hmm. STEM professor, but it's actually just essential to our survival in higher education right now. Uh, this is just really super critical. I just can't think of any more important work to be doing. This is not an add-on or a luxury. This is, this is the essence of the work that we need to be doing. And I hope we can kind of get that message to others that are in our, our circles as well. So thanks, thanks. for that, Brian. Thanks. No, thank you, Karen. Yeah, and if anybody else wants to ex express anything, I did I did actually, I was thinking maybe we would start with the, the question or two that we had from last time, Brian, but um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to yep. give people a chance to respond to, to us as well. And maybe there's nothing to say other than throw your hands in the air. <laughs> Um, well, Karen, at, at the risk of 
um, dominating. Uh, maybe less of a question and more of a, a another a hope, right? This is this is the hopeful part of it. I, I think those of you slash us who do this work, uh, this is part of lessons learned from things that are happening. Those of us who do this work in places that are supportive of what we do, I, I think it behooves us, or at the very least, it's worth our while to not just do it and be glad you're not no one's stopping you from doing it. Do it in ways that you can actually measure its impact. Right. So if, if you're teaching for civic engagement, if you're teaching for equity, you know, when, when the Karens and Brian's of the world come and say you need to measure social belonging, measuring sense of community is, is not just because we're academics and we like to measure things. It's because the point needs to be made that when we teach and create environment in this way, there is an impact that's tangible and people can see so that if and when these toxic things arise, we have a cogent argument to rebut that with other than that's not right, right? <laughs> right. So, so we, we need to, you know, at the risk of being too academic, we need to be, have a kind of a KPI mindset when it comes to equity work. It's, it's a little frustrating because I find it's the one side of campus where just doing something equity related sometimes counts as its own assessment, right? So it's like, what are you doing? Um, uh, how, how do you know your campus is equitable? Well, we have a learning community. But what I, you just have it. You don't know that it's having any effect, right? So, so this, this, this mindset of when you teach in this way, when you do you know, any part of campus life in this way, that automatically you should be trying to figure out how it's improving the social growth and the lives of the students. Um, I encourage those of us who can still do that <laughs> as part of your job to, to find ways to do it because it can, I think it can help the others, right? It can help those who may have to have this conversation with their political superiors in the future. So no, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> no, it's a great point. It's a great point in that being able to do that research and publish papers around it could be part of your promotion and tenure package as well. Like this is kind of the kind of thing that we want to be putting out there that this is the work. Um, and that if it's valued in the academy, it will, it will count. You know, we always worry about the things that we're doing counting. Mm -hmm. um, so great. Thank you for that. Um, I think that uh, one of the questions that came up last time uh, that folks were asking, because we were talking a lot about just to kind of switch gears, but it's not really switch, switching gears to talk about uh, trusting students and allowing them to do things, because this is all part of this conversation. And um, uh, a couple of folks were had brought up the fact that sometimes when you when you do things differently in your classroom, you know, when I'm suggesting that you do crazy things like get rid of grades or assignments or let your students drive the syllabus or do, that people are like um, a lot of people jumping in and saying, yeah, I really want to try that. And then what happens is you can meet with a lot of student resistance, you know, like students are like, what the are you do, do you really know what you're doing what kind of professor are you do you really understand biology you don't really know your subject so you're making us do all the work like all of those kinds of things and I've heard that kind of stuff myself and so you know I have had some approaches to dealing with student resistance in the past but I'm wondering um, if we could take a few minutes to hear what some of you have dealt with in terms of student resistance and, and sort of the approaches that you've taken uh, you know along this line of thinking about uh student agency empowerment and trust just, just throwing that out there <laughs> i hope that's okay brian to just yep, start yep, with that. perfect perfect i see people writing things in the chat um, Laura, you want to speak out loud? They're tearing down a wall in my condo, so it's kind of noisy here, but I'll just say that for me, student voices were the key both for uh, talking to administrators. It's like, please listen to my students, here's what they have to say. And also in, in calming student fears, the way I introduced ungrading in my classes every semester, the very first thing was, here, here's what past students say about it. and since all the feedback I got from students was was positive, that was a big help. I put a link in the chat for a collection. I have a student comments over like 10 years, I guess, from our student course evaluation. So students talking to students, I think is really, really important. And Veronica, did I see your hand raised there for a blip? Yeah, just for a moment, I was 
just I was typing it out in the chat. Um, I've been uh, really pleased with the effects that it has on student participation and and how involving students in creation is something that once you do it, once you get through the process for the first time, students are really on board. But I could not have been prepared for the kind of resistance that I experienced from students early on in the process. Uh, when I first started doing some of this work, I was, I think for many of the students, the first, it's the first time they'd ever done anything so revolutionary to have, you know, the option of including their voice in the syllabus or creating something or, you know, you name it. And it was a little disheartening at first to feel that student resistance, but I think it came from the idea that we have these roles or students understood the rules, the expectations, they knew how to get those marks and, and meet the requirement for an assignment. And then when you try something that's so new and so different for them, they just didn't have a script or, or any way of navigating those contingencies. Yeah. So I think, I think it's really important. You know, I was kind of reminded of thinking about this because, you know, my partner and I have a dog who's not so well behaved. And so we put him on a long, kind of a uh, rope sort of thing in the backyard and let him, cause there's no fence. And so one time it broke, you know, <laughs> like, and, and uh, but it, it's like, he's so acculturated to that rope that he just did not go past the edge of it. He just wandered where like, they're so like dogs are so trained behaviorally to behave in a certain way that's expected of them. And, you know, our students are, I'm not trying to say they're like dogs, but, but our students are definitely uh, acclimated and acculturated to the environment of higher education about like, you know, all you need to do is get a good grade. You have to jump through this hoop. You have to do it this way. And that, and the really successful students are good at that. Like they know how to work the system. You know, my best students could be the most resistant ones because like I had to get an A, I had to work this system. Like don't change it on me. <laughs> and so that can be some of the resistance for sure. And so um, I, I think the most helpful thing that I have found for myself with my students is just to continually talk to them and explain what I'm doing, <laughs> explain my pedagogy. I talk to them about open pedagogy and how I define it. And I say, you know, all of your professors are enacting a pedagogy. They just may or may not be transparent about it or naming it. So let's talk every day at the beginning of class what that means and why I'm doing it and why it might be helpful for you and how you're finding it to be. So I think staying in a constant discussion, continuous, not just let's explain all the rules on the first day and let you go, but a continuous conversation and dialogue back and forth with your students on a class by class daily basis, I think can be uh, super, super powerful. So um, do, do others have uh, things to add to this conversation? Could, could I add a couple of thoughts Please? to that? Um, so uh, basically three studies. Um, one is, um, I believe it's Morales Doyle, uh, 2017, the Journal of Science Education, and they talk about involving students in a social justice curriculum in chemistry. So they use some of the principles in chemistry to, to deal with environmental racism questions. And so I, and I think as part of that curriculum, they co-design some of the exams with the students. Um, so having that, having them kind of be a part of the curriculum design and, you know, sort of help with the re potential resistance, um, you know, not just trying to say that's a sky hook and it works every time, but just something to think about is actually data on that. Um, second study, and I remember I read this paper years ago as a grad student, and I could never find it after that. And I can swear the title is Pedagogy of the Dispossessed. And it was an ethnography of an English teacher at college level talking about exactly what you just described, like this process of giving up the classroom. And she, I'm pretty sure that she kind of walked you through this feeling of losing control and what that was like. And, and this intermediate moment where it's just chaotic and you're like, oh my God, what did I just do? But then seeing that whole thing transition to a place of beauty, if anybody get their hands on that paper, maybe I have the title wrong. I would love to get it again because I never forgot it, but I guess I didn't save it. I was a bad grad student, I apologize. Um, so if you do like put a link or send me an email or something like that. So if you find it, it's really good. The, <laughs> no, Karen. Right? Uh, the, third, 
The third paper, um, and it's in review right now, but it should come out relatively soon. One of my former grad students looked at, um, at uh, how students study and using the a questionnaire, the SPQ, so student process or study process questionnaire. And if you're familiar with that instrument, what it does, depending on how the students answer, they, they categorize them into strategic service or deep learners, right? And so I thought about that when Karen made her comment because one of the really interesting things we found in that study was that the deep learners did better only when the teacher taught in a way that encouraged metacognition. So if you are a deep learner in a straight up lecture class, a straight up power is in one direction, it didn't matter, right? In fact, the surface learners were the best in that class. But the, the, the type of learning, deep learning had to match, right? A particular type of teaching. So, so to, to, to one of the lessons there for us at least is, it's not just about giving up power and having students lead the class and stuff, but they have to trust that you're doing it in an authentic way, right? So our first session was on trust and power. They have to trust that the power is in fact shared to a certain degree, right? Um, and that allows a little bit more of an authentic engagement by them in what some of the things you're asking them to do. Um, so th these are great points. Thanks for letting me. Um, no, it's great. I, uh, if, if anybody from said paper. <laughs> I love it. You know, I love that sort of like students being skeptical. Ooh. We teach science students. <laughs> Somebody think, found it. Yeah, I think awesome. Veronica for the win. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. You don't have no idea how happy I am right now. Did you DM <laughs> it? Because I don't see it. Okay. Well, because I kept putting dispossessed. It was distressed. Um, thanks, Veronica. There it is. My thing's just a little slow. So, um, uh, Heba. Yes. Uh, I just have a question. Um, when we meet this kind of resistance and we see that students are objecting on uh, whatever we are doing, to what extent should we listen to them and allow them to, to have a say in what we are doing? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know that there's a formulaic answer to that. Like, how much should we give in to them? I think I think yes. it's kind of tricky. Like, how much do we say, really? No, I, I mean it. Like, I know you don't trust me yet, but I, I really, I, I'm saying what I mean to be true. Like, well, what do you mean we're going to grade ourselves? You know, I don't trust you. So it, take, it does take that time. And and I, I have told the story when I, you know, I've taught, uh, I had a really resistant student in an invert so class that I taught once. And I'm like, you want exams? I got 25 years worth of practical and other exams. You want to take tests, buddy? You can do it. And I just let him do it because I had them. You know, I would, you know, it's I'm not suggesting you want to have to run your course two different ways, but once he saw that his peers were doing stuff that they were really getting excited about, and he had to come in and take tests and turn in papers. And I even set up a practical exam just for him, you know, just the way that he was like after one time a couple of tests through he was like uh actually can i can i change my mind and do it the other way so um i think it depends on your level of uh, how much time that's going to take how much energy you have and you know in the way in which you can do it to say okay now i'm going to change the whole class just for you and where that resistance is coming from you know do students can start to build a little bandwagon you know, so it can be a little tricky to negotiate and uh, maybe others have some suggestions with that as well. Well, I just want to quickly vote what Veronica put in the chat because um, I think everything you're saying is correct, Karen, but how, how they're starting with that framing, right? So when your resistance comes and, and this, I don't know if this is where Veronica got the language from, but, you know, when we do difficult dialogues consultation, that is the kind of mindset you go in with because difficult moments come up. And when they do, what you do is you train yourself not to have that immediate emotional reaction. You ask, I wonder what brought them to this place. I wonder why they are having such a difficult time, right? And so it feels as though Veronica is doing the same thing, but in the resistance paradigm, you know, before you come up with a solution, I wonder what is the thing? I don't know if I go to what WTF, but I'll let you make your choices. <laughs> but um, I wonder what is the function, what, what's the function, what's the clarity they're not getting and why are they objecting? And that might a lot of times point to issues in your own communication, not to say you're a bad teacher or anything, but if it's a communication issue, then it can help lessen the temperature and the resistance. Thanks, Veronica. 
That's great. Yeah, others have anything they want to add? Uh, 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 Aaliyah, if I say that right. Yes, thank you, Karen. Hello, everyone. Good to see you all. I just wanted to emphasize on the importance of feedback from students, especially when taken during class time. I had one of my previous professors do this during actually the lecture, just for 10 minutes there. He had a survey prepared, distributed to the students that were there. We all did it. And it basically gave space for us to elaborate further on any concerns we have. And exactly, Laura, it was anonymous. So we've really included everything we had in mind without feeling, you know, without fear of being judged or if some students are so concerned about their grades, you know, they might, you know, sugarcoat things just, you know, to make sure they get the grade or whatever it may be. No, it wasn't that case. It, they were anonymous. They were free to do it. They had assigned class time for it. And uh, that basically ensured as well that a lot of people actually filled in the survey, if not the whole class, as opposed to doing it on your own time when you might just, you know, skip it or not do it at all. So it's very important to do it anonymously during class time, in my, my opinion, and uh, to give free space, open-ended questions, even for students to elaborate and express themselves freely. Great, that's a great suggestion. Thank you for that. I see people putting some things in the chat about how to do anonymous uh, suggestion boxes in Canvas and awesome. You're all just a wealth of information. <laughs> okay. Great. I, I don't know if we want to kind of move on to some other stuff here in the interest of time. Uh, so, Brian, you want me to share my screen and then just let you talk about that first slide and whichever the other slides you want to talk about? Yeah, well, it'll just be the first slide. But yes, um, Aliyah, I'm assuming you don't have another question. Oh, I see. Oh, that. sorry. I'll lower my hand. No worries. I it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Yeah, I just want to make sure we're not ignoring you. <laughs> Two questions. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see if I'm going to get this screen sharing. Okay. Can you all see that? It says session two. And Brian. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so welcome back. And I'm glad we were able to start off today with a little bit of a conversation. And, and just as a reminder, our last session, we talked a little bit about, about trust and power. And, and, you know, full disclosure, I believe it's Karen and Maha who came up with the titles of the sessions, um, but, but this, this sequence is perfect, right? Because to me, we can't start talking about reframing anything before we understand how trust and power works in a society or societies that rely on power dynamics being the way they are to maintain certain things. The, 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 Please be, you know, be patient with us here because sometimes we like to live in the 30,000 feet part, but it's, it's important to understand the, the magnitude and scope of what's being discussed philosophically and politically before we get to the business of what that assignment is supposed to look like. So trust and power is one thing. And if you kind of understand that, you start thinking about how do you build trust? How do you then reframe what it means to be equitable in a STEM classroom? And I will confess to you that as somebody who's been in STEM for three degrees and eight years as a faculty member, I still bristle at the in STEM education part of titles like that. <laughs> because it, 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 it feeds into this notion that we have in STEM that we're special, <laughs> right? Could do that over there in African-American studies class and lit class, but no, 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 this is, this is bio. We're here to talk about molecules and DNA splitting and things like that. And, and the, the work, right, the activation energy to use a biology term required to get people to see the role that equity plays in our everyday practice has, has amazed even me. And that's why I, I, I hammer again and again, the, we teach students, not subjects, citation, Elizabeth Mohey, 1996, reading quarterly, it's a beautiful ethnography. That starting with that framing changes the conversation. And it, it, was, it was really driven home to me several years ago when I read a book called um, Reign of Error by Diane Ravitch. And if you don't know Diane Ravitch, she's a K-12 scholar based at NYU and she writes a lot about um, equity in the K-12 space. And in the, in the introduction of that book, and Reign is R-E-I-G-H-N, not, not Rain Rain. 
Um, in the introduction of that book, she says, don't talk, come and talk to me about repairing schools until you're willing to talk about universal health care for pregnant mothers, until you're willing to talk about universal pre, uh, 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 um, child care, until you're willing to talk about the relationship between property taxes and, and the resources schools have, until you're willing to talk about PTO, like until you're willing to talk about all of those things, don't walk into my office and ask me how to fix schools, right? Because then the question presupposes a disconnection between this building and all its occupants and things that are happening in this community every day. So it, it's, you know, I read the line and you almost feel it's one of those sentences in a book that could go, you could stumble past and not realize its power. And it, it, it stuck with me because in a different yet related sense, we have a similar question to answer at the higher ed level. I have an essay I'm working on, on based on this image, Karen, which is why I said keep it. <laughs> and, and I actually reached out to, to Craig Frail. Uh, he's a professor, business professor at Ohio State, I believe, unless he, unless he no, Cincinnati, Cincinnati. Um, and you, you, if, for people, especially those in the American context, you've probably have seen various iterations of this image with critiques, right? Good critiques. Um, and, I, and I do like this version the most. Um, and, and part of that, part of the reason I like this version the most is the previous version, the last picture still had the fence. The last picture still had the fence. So in, in previous versions, and I'm not critiquing it, you know, these things evolve and they get better. That's how it works, right? But, but, but the, the, the message was these barriers exist. There's pretty much nothing we can do about it. So all you have to do is up the support structures, like up, up the, 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 uh, you know, the boxes and the ladders. And, you know, so, the, so, so these things essentially, be, essentially become metaphors for things like affirmative action, for things like, you know, the extra hours I give into advising the, the, the scholarship, you know, it's, and I'm not critiquing any of those things. But the problem is, those extra support structures sometimes distract us from the work needing to remove the barrier in the first place. Cornel West said, don't spend your time celebrating the exceptional Negro. Wonder why everybody else in that community couldn't, didn't have the resources to achieve as much as this individual. Why do they have to overcome so much just to be this good? So, so please, by all means, this is not Brian saying he's against all of those support structures. Keep doing it. We need that. We, we know we need that. But part of our work is also understanding and working in some aspect of our lives, whether it's how we vote, how we donate money, how we spend our time, the books we're reading, educating ourselves. Part of our time has to be spent in figuring out how to remove those barriers entirely. So what I'm presenting to you right now, this slide right here for me represents the curriculum or a major part of the curriculum that anyone who's preparing to be in a classroom should be engaging in. I was talking to an undergraduate uh, student at UCLA yesterday and I was actually, it was a really beautiful conversation because she's a rising junior who wants to become a professor of teaching. Like she wants, that's her career goal. She wants to be the teacher in university and she wants to be a full, just teach and maybe do a little subtle, but you know, not trying to have like a proteins research program, right? And it's, I haven't really met much undergraduates who have been able to identify that as a goal. And so she reached out to me to ask like, what are the things she should be doing now to prepare herself to be a competitive grad applicant? And of course, part of my brain was like, you want to come to my lab? Dude, like, you are awesome. Anyway, but, but I, I kept the advice general. And I said, yeah, you know, you're, you can volunteer in an in a, in a education research lab, you know, get some teaching opportunities and a learning assistant, et cetera. But, but your reading list should begin to expose you, expose you to the history of the relationship between education and broader social equity. At times when that relationship was tight and at times when that relationship was broken. 
So we, we didn't start thinking about these things yesterday, right? So Carter G. Woodson was writing about decolonizing the classroom in the 1930s, right? You know, Sylvia Winter was writing about decolonizing classrooms in the 1950s. You know, Miles Horton was talking about, I mean, we could make a list, right? We, we are building on a long history of this. So if you, uh, if you are willing to believe with me that a classroom is a place can, yes, develop technical expertise and prepare people to go on to become wonderful scientists, wonderful mayors, wonderful business owners, wonderful electricians and what have you. But it's also a place where we engage in the business of working with each other productively, discussing and disagreeing productively, learning about each other and our backgrounds and our histories productively, learning about the mystics and the successes we've had in this world productively, then making sure that everybody who's physically present in that classroom is fully, has no barriers to being fully engaged in that has to be a precursor <laughs> to any of the pages of that textbook. So when I talk about intro bio, which I did a little bit uh, when we met a couple of days ago, and I say, we're gonna have student hours, not office hours. I know that for some students walking down the hall to my office is represented by that fence. I know that this notion in psychology, they call it John Henryism, that to ask for help is a sign of weakness is represented by that fence. I know that for students who see a high stakes exam after three weeks of their first science class and use that high stakes exam to reflect on whether they can be a scientist or not, that is represented by that fence. So when you change your grading system and when you choose to do the office hours in the dorm, when you choose to, to you know, engage in collaborative group work or you know, have more representational diversity in your slides, you're not just doing it because it's a cute active learning trip, you're doing it because you're trying to remove that fence. And so I hope you, we only have 75 minutes with you all, right? So we can't go through the whole enchilada, but I hope you, when we bring up these strategies that I hope you see it in that light. Teaching is not an apolitical act, <laughs> whether we like that or not. And the fact that we, we haven't realized that is why my wife is on a 1 a.m., 1 p.m. <laughs> meeting with the union. Karen, I'll pause there and, and toss to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so it's like, wow, I'm always just so blown away by you, Brian. I want you to always be the first one to speak before I speak in, in all of my talks now. You're so awesome. Um, and also, <laughs> and I also like, uh, I, I have way too many slides. I can overcompensate with having um, not as many brilliant things to say as Brian by having too many slides. So <laughs> I'll try to go through them kind of quickly. And um, I love everything that you said about this, about taking down barriers and, um, I, you know, as I, as you know, I, I kind of come from the open education world and we think about how openness can be one of the tools or levers for how to do that. Cause there's always this like, how do we do that kind of thing? And, you know, I often put um, OER in this uh, category of equity because you give everybody free access to textbooks. You're basically kind of trying to achieve this equity goal. And, and that's not a bad thing. Like Brian was saying, it's not bad but it's really just not nearly enough, right? And so for me, the idea of liberation and taking down fences can possibly be achieved with open pedagogy. And I put the question mark there because, you know, there, as Robin DeRosa reminds us that, you know, the open is not a panacea, right? There's no panacea mm -hmm. for open. It's how we use it, how we enact it. And, um, and I talk about how the leveraging of an open license where students can create things on their own and share it to the world and have that message can be a way of liberating uh, education for them. Um, and so I just wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, these principles of social justice that were originally laid out by Sarah Lambert and, and also Maha Bali and uh, Catherine Cronin and Rashid Janjiani who uh, followed up in a publication of theirs. Uh, there's a couple of citations down here. But the idea of having just free stuff, free educational resources, whether the textbooks or other stuff, 
it's kind of a form of economic justice, which is which is great, right? Um, but they they also talk about you know cultural justice or cognitive justice, where materials that they may be using actually um, are inclusive and include images and case studies and knowledges of of other people. So if you're a faculty member or a professional putting a book together, you can try to uh, put these kinds of include these kinds of images and other pieces in the work that you do. But this this third level, uh, this is what I find myself most personally interested in. Like, what does it me really mean to achieve uh, what, what Lambert calls representational justice or political justice, which is having self-determination of marginalized people in groups to speak for themselves, right? To have stories about people of color told by people of color, about experiences about women by women, gay people by gay people, um, for us to be able to speak about ourselves. And in, in, in the context of thinking about students, how do we allow our students of whatever places they come from to actually have their voice and their viewpoints in the, in the work and material that we do. Um, I'm gonna go through some of this quickly. These, these are just examples of people doing things with open textbooks, like remixing open textbooks through an equity lens as a project for, for a consortium of six public uh, uh, colleges and universities in Massachusetts. And I'm gonna zip past this. I can send links about it. It's a great project. Um, there's the idea framework. I can also give you a link to this 15 page framework where you can review your materials in the terms of everything that's on this list, looking at illustrations and names and gender inclusivity and uh, applications, terminology, a lot of really good stuff here. In fact, this framework, which is uh, um, part of a working group of the Rios Institute that you have a chance to learn a little bit more about and maybe become a member of if you want, um, is uh, undergoing revision and is just gonna be um, put out there more broadly for people to be able to use. And here's just an example of thinking about that. Like on the left, you see a typical uh, white person in high heel shoes. And this is a lesson about how high heel shoes can affect the anatomy of the foot. And just doing something, if you're talking about bones and anatomy and pressure and if you have whatever you're teaching about in a biological context, you can use examples by changing names, you know, and changing pictures and changing pronouns and that can have a huge influence on a student just seeing themselves represented. You, know, you talk about, you know, querying the pedagogy of the work that you do. There's just a million examples. And this is just one small example that you can use in by taking existing materials and remixing it and revising it or asking your students to, you know, so they can learn the science and, and the cultural context at the same time. Um, I hope you all had a chance to do the reading or look at the video that we had posted on our website for this session, which was looking at um, thinking about what equity is and uh, the thinking beyond equity, you know, and I just put these quotes from Edna Tan, who was um, in that video and has published papers with others, where she says typical equity goals revolve around helping students to fit into larger systems as they are already constituted without working to critique and transform the underlying power structures, right? Like, so go into the classroom and just learn how to be a good little scientist and do it our way. And the more that you act, probably, you know, white and cis and heterosexual <laughs> and male, the more you're gonna be successful in this system. And so she talks about how equity as inclusion is built on the guest host relationship model, right? Students are guests in the classroom and they're expected to follow dominant routines and practices. So marginalized students, even when they're positioned as a welcome guest, which isn't even the case most of the time to start with, but even if they are, they're expected to reconfigure themselves towards a majority culture. And so when we think about like how we teach science and what science is and how we learn it, I think this is this is a big, this is a really tall order for us to, to think about what it means to question these dominant power, power structures and paradigms. Um, to give you a little bit of an example of how I've tried to approach this in some of the classes that I teach, I, 
I teach actually a non-majors course in evolution and human behavior. And we talk about a lot of things like how do genes influence human behavior? And we talk about what genes are and how, how do genes influence other things like skin color? And we talk about the genetics of race and the genetic, actually the genetics of skin color rather. And then what does that mean in terms of the social construction of race? And so um, this particular student, because I gave them what we call a domain of one's own, like having a just a space on the web it, akin to Virginia Woolf's room of one own, just to write and think and process however you want to. She took the lessons of thinking about the genetics of skin color in the context of her own family and was thinking about the social construction of race and racism and how that's built. And she did this wonderful job of writing about that. And, you know, there was no assignment other than write anything that you think you would, anything that's important to you in terms of a reflection about this material that we're learning about, about how genes might affect skin color. So I think it's pretty interesting and it really kind of highlights this idea of self-determination for, for groups, for students to, to speak for themselves and contextualize what they're learning. And the fact that she can openly license it and share it to her peers and to others gives it more meaning for her too, because she could, she could turn this in as an assignment just to me, but again, it becomes this non-disposable assignment, this thing that adds value that still lives on the web today, even though I taught this particular class a number of years ago and can be shared. And I think that has a lot of value to it. Um, there's a lot of ways in which you can utilize open pedagogical practices having students editing Wikipedia articles, like students, uh, Wikipedia, people complain, oh, they're they're too sexist and they're too biased. And well, get, get in there and actually edit it. You know, that's like one of the largest audiences your students can have and the, their, their opportunity to uh, cover racial justice or any particular topic in any way um, to remove sexism by giving examples of women doing powerful things. The whole Wiki Education group is, uh, again, I could spend so much more time talking about it. Um, and uh, this is a really exciting project at uh, Montgomery College, uh, together with some other like Kwantlen Polytech University and others, where they're doing these, um, uh, having these uh, assignments that are linked to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And so they have these open pedagogy fellowship projects where students are creating these different kinds of projects. You can see examples here, like Dennis on the go, or um, the human rights violations in the fashion industry. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of environmental pieces here. And, and, the, and the, just the fact that you're thinking about linking it to sustainable development, sustainable development goals, which gives it a global perspective, and that you can openly license the work, put it out there, share it, allow students to have their voice, look at this issue in the way that they want to and, and share it with others. And I, I think these are just some really powerful examples. And th this is not an exhaustive list. These are just some things to try to uh, whet your appetite here. So in the time that we have left, um, and uh, we can do breakout groups again, if you think, Brian, these are some of the questions that we pose to you ahead of time. We, we already dealt with number four. I had put this in ahead of time in case we didn't get a chance to. Um, so these first three questions about what in your local context has been some of the greatest challenges to creating equity-minded environments and what support structures do you need to help work toward a solution? And then if a focus on equity and science is inadequate in efforts to work towards anti-racism and social justice, as Edna Tan asserts, then what is the work that we need to be doing? How do we do that work? So I'm going to um, stop the screen share and try to uh, copy these questions into the chat. And make sure everybody has them. Hopefully you can see them all. <laughs> and then I'll create some breakout rooms. What do you think, Brian? How many minutes? Uh, uh, 12. 12 is perfect. And uh, what did we do last time? Four rooms? Yeah, I think that worked. So okay. Like even four per. Okay. All right. So go ahead and uh, in about 12 minutes, we'll come back and have a big group discussion too. These are randomly assigned, by the way. So.
You there, Matt? You with us? There he is.
we didn't have enough time to answer the last question. <laughs> or even I know the there's never enough time. We get we get sucked back. But uh, yeah, whoever <laughs> feels like they were right in the middle of a per important point, and go ahead. <laughs> get to get to the last question yeah, perhaps we can discuss the last question like together all of us here as a group how we can deal with student resistance yeah and push That's I, think we, we I think we also began this whole session with that question too like we talked a lot about it in the beginning which is why we've spent a little bit of time but we i'm happy for us to talk more about it if that's where people want to be but um i'd love to hear other sort of takeaways from some addressing some of the other questions. I know we only have like this guy this time, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but it, this seems to have gone lightningly fast today. It only goes fast when it goes well. <laughs> that's good. That's good. And it's something that somebody in our breakout room was talking about is like, yeah, you can teach about um, genetics of skin color, but when you start talking about social construction of race, you feel like you're kind of out of your area of expertise. And like, am I a biologist? Am I a social scientist? And so, and I, and I think what I'm suggesting is that um, you can stay within your so-called area of expertise, but we can also expand our, what we understand as our area of expertise by learning a little bit more and, and allowing our students to bring, to bring that up, which is what I did with that student. I didn't tell her. Rebecca, you had your hand raised, sir. Yes, sorry, I'm on my iPad, I'm not as good with the controls. I just wanted to like bring out something that Amy said, which I really resonated with which was, I think the second question of like structures to create. And one of the things that she said was um, creating structures where it's okay to try something and fail, which I think in academia, we kind of see ourselves as like these, you know, pinnacle sort of people and we don't make a mistake. So, um, and I, you know, a lot of our sort of progress is based on not making mistakes. Um, so I don't know the idea, I think for me, I'm like, well, somebody else create a safe space for me, but maybe we can create those spaces either for ourselves or for other people, the space where it's okay to say, I'm going to try this and it might be terrible, but at least I'm trying it. That's all. Great. Thank you. Well, Rebecca, um, thanks for saying that. And, and thanks for being willing to say that because um, I will say that a question I get a lot in, in my travels is, you know, Brian, I'm white male, old, who am I to go in front of the classroom and talk about your ski study? Um, and I said, you're a human being who cares about these issues and is willing to try, right? If, if the future of this work is for all of, for those of us who identify in some marginalized category to only have the right, only be only people to have the right to talk about those issues, then we have a long road ahead. <laughs> And it's, it's, it's difficult to get into spaces where you may not identify in that type of marginalization. And there, is, there are gonna be mistakes, but, but I, I, I am happy to hear about your willingness to be vulnerable and, and you, know, you put the work in, but you know you're not gonna hit it out to the ballpark the first 10 times, right? Um, but as long as you're authentic, I think faculty will be surprised how much students will respect the attempt, as long as it's authentic and not patronizing. Um, so thank you, and I encourage you to keep keep going. I appreciate that. And I some somebody was saying I don't know if I believe in safe spaces anymore, because I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying, Brian, about having all voices be there. But I also really treasure my lesbian only space, so I just want to put that out there. I think yep, you can yep. have both. You know, yep, you absolutely can have both. Yep. <laughs> Others. step away i know we just have a couple of minutes left there's a lot to try to like mm. in 12 minutes discuss how we're going to dismantle the <laughs> well just to, to stay on the theme of to stay on the theme of learning um because you, you kind of said it just now karen like it might be okay talking about genetics of race but then when you get into the social context of race like there are people who have phds in this stuff right so is, is brian and karen being careless by saying you just need to go and learn about stuff I think I want to qualify that piece of advice with, we know you can't go and get a second PhD in sociology, right? But, but your reading list and your listening list can perhaps at least open the door to some understanding of it. And this is where I think podcasts or sort of what I put in the chat could be helpful because I'm not, it, not, it doesn't replace writing a dissertation on it, 
But it's such a well-curated, well-communicated understanding of how this notion of race and white and all of that came happen over generations, right? It's a 12-part series. And each one, they, he sort of walks you through like how it's worked and how it's... And it, I mean, I might even argue at the risk of offending sociologists, like I might even argue you might have a better understanding of it from listening to that than you might picking up a textbook. Um, so, so in other words, take advantage of places that have curated these things in ways that make it digestible and understandable. And that one is just like top class. That just is one of the best. Yeah, I think also we want our students, most many of us are like, we want them to be these well-rounded liberal arts educated students. And yet we feel like it's okay to stay within our <laughs> silo. So if you could at least be at a bachelor's level of some of these topics, I think that's kind of a, a small expectation. Um, I know we're just about running out of time. Um, and, and, and tomorrow we're gonna talk more about open science uh, and the pedagogy of open science and how that connects to the rest of these kinds of discussions. Um, I'm gonna, I, I wanted to, um, and Melanie was reminding me uh, that uh, um, I wanted to share with you a publication that just came out from the Rios community just so that you have a chance to learn a little bit more about what Rios is about and what we do within this community of scientists that, that work at the intersections of STEM ed and open ed and social justice. And so um, you can skip everything, go down to the bottom and just click on the link to join the Rios Institute. <laughs> it doesn't cost you any money. <laughs> it's just like trying to build this as a, as a group. But, but anyway, that's there for you. And um, I know we're almost out of time. And any any last words, Brian? That's it. Thank you. Thank you again for a rich conversation and learning from you as usual. Um, as I said in my small group, I, I really enjoy learning about the international context. So um, one of the things I love about my fest. So thank you for those of, who bring in that it's, perspective to this. It's awesome. Yeah. I know we work too much in the US centric world. So, all right. Thanks, everybody. See you tomorrow. I'm happy to stick around if anybody has any questions or something. But yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. Just working on your tech, or did you want to ask me something? You're muted still, though. I wanted the slide deck, and I was just texting, chatting with Laura about it. If you could post that, there were so many quotes, and I, it was just too much to write down. Yeah, it's way too much. Yeah, I'll yeah. definitely. How about if I um, get it together to share for tomorrow? Yeah, or email it to the group that was here, or whatever works. I don't want to make more work for you, but no, it no, it's okay. Awesome. I just actually, you know what? I can just take the link. The only thing I'm not sure. Yeah, just make sure yeah, that you have it the way you want it. So. See if it see if it'll open. I can't remember whether I shared it public or not, or whether just to Brian. That's what I can't remember. <laughs> Was planning on sharing public. So it opens, but I think now I could edit it too and mess with it. So you might want to set it to one of those. Only. Okay. Yeah. And actually, and I, I might, promise I, I won't. Might... I'm just gonna close it right now, and I promise I won't touch it. No, no worries about it. And I'm gonna, I'll do some uh, tweaking for session three a little bit too. I might have too many slides in there again. I always have to. Because I love that slide where you had like the social justice principles. And stuff and I think that would be really cool like too to show maybe to some of my colleagues but I couldn't get everything down and was that from the from the um idea today. framework no from today it was like the first thing you started with when you took over it was just a table it started with like economic justice free text oh that one yeah yeah, yeah. okay all right I'll I definitely mean, get yeah this and I couldn't even write while. down all the principles and you already have it so well organized so it would be like a good one to to throw at people when they like come at me. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And then there's also the citations where that came from in there too. Oh, so I'll, be, yeah. yeah, get all that so, together by tomorrow. <laughs> sweet. Thank you so much, Karen. All right. Thank you, Anna. We'll see you tomorrow. Okay. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.